Hello, dear friends, and welcome to another episode of Life of Love. We're so happy to have you here in this beautiful day, and we have a wonderful guest today. I'm excited to introduce Moira Dodd. She has over 25 years experience as a therapist, um, but her story is so much more. She's She's a counselor who specializes in trauma, bereavement, and stress management, and she's written a heartfelt memoir entitled Cherishing Me Letters from a Motherless Child. We are both warriors for joy and finding what our soul messages are. So it's my deep honor to introduce Moria to Life of Love. Thank you, Moria, for being here. Oh, thank you, Julie. It's an absolute joy to be here. It's a real mm -hmm. honor. Thank you so much. Well, well, thank you. And thank you for everything that you put out. You're constantly adding to your repertoire of healing modalities and helping people figure out what their challenges are and, and beliefs that might be limiting them and obstacles. And so I would I would love for you to share with the audience. I've I've listened to your audiobook and I know your story um, from that. But if you could just give my listeners a little background as to what were your obstacles to joy and, and a little your backstory, because it's it's a very powerful, uh, courageous recovery. And, it, you know, it's just, I just am very excited for you to let everyone know that your story. Oh, thank you so much. I'm feeling really emotional just hearing you introduce me like that, because it, it is quite a story. Um, yeah, I didn't have any joy, Julie, at all in my young life, in my childhood. So my, I, I do have an older sister, uh, but when I was born, I was 10 months old, and I don't know why, but my mother killed herself. So we can only imagine that she had a postnatal psychosis. Um, obviously, I don't remember anything at all from those days. So my father, so I'm nearly 70, so we're going back to the early 50s, 1950s, a long, long time ago. <laughs> And in those days, I guess men didn't take on children in the same way that they might do nowadays. Uh, I'm letting my father off the hook here, really. Uh, so anyway, he, he decided in his wisdom to place my older sister with his parents. So she went to live with paternal grandparents and I was put into care. So... Um, by the time I was three, I'd had six foster homes. Now, why I needed six, I will never know. I don't know why nobody kept me. I, I really can't imagine. And uh, when I was three, I was placed into an orphanage. Now, an orphanage, you'd think, is for a child with both parents who had died. But this particular orphanage was for many children who had lost one parent. Um, it was still called an orphanage. Uh, it was a pretty loveless place. Um, and uh, I, after 50 years, I was able to get my records, my official records about my story. And it was quite a harrowing read because every few months there were entries in this book which stated how difficult I was. And the best way the staff could deal with me was to ignore me. Um, I mean, it, 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 it was really joyless, absolutely loveless and, and joyless. And uh, any child living there would disobey the rules at their peril. There would be harsh punishments. Uh, it, it was harsh indeed. I learned to make beds, though. I, I do a, a good mitered corner on the end of a bed because <laughs> I had to make the bed every day. <laughs> we lived in dormitory like um, uh, buildings, rather like uh, an army barracks, mm -hmm. rows and rows and rows of beds. So, uh, yeah, I could, yeah. I could go on. I could go on and on, Julie, telling you all sorts right. of things. But anyway, there it is. There's the basis wow. of my story. But but my, that was my my curiosity was the the six foster homes, but you couldn't find any records from social services as to no. who those foster parents were or the situation or if you had experienced abuse. 
um, and as an early from six months to three years, you bounce to different homes. Yes. And so obviously there's a lack of, there's a lack of understanding of just normal childhood development that that could happen. Yeah. Yeah. There was no knowledge really back then. I sound very old back then. <laughs> I know. We could all, I could say that too. I have some back then stories myself, but you know, and just looking back 50 years, how much human consciousness and responsibility to human life has increased. I mean, absolutely. Yes. That is astounding. Yes. And were the orphanage run by, um, like clergy, like nuns, or yes, they weren't nuns. It was a Christian orphanage, um, so uh, it was uh, founded by a Baptist minister, a, a very famous preacher called, um, I think his name was John Haddon Spurgeon. So it was called a Spurgeon's Home because that was his surname. Um. And it was originally founded for boys, boys who'd come out of families through the war uh, and they were very poor. Uh, maybe people had been killed in the war. And so they were housing or trying to rehome boys and give them a trade to practice, um, you know, carpentry or I don't know, lots of different trades. Um, and then later on, they started taking girls. Okay. So I went there in 1959. And do you have any record of your mother's parents? I mean. Well, the only record I have. Um, so this is this is another story, really. When I was much older and I had children of my own, um, I decided just suddenly one day, I thought, I wonder if there's anyone still alive that might have known my mother. Mm -hmm. So I started doing a search. That's that's a very long story. I did a search. You know how bureaucracy is going through, you know, papers and newspapers and all sorts of different offices. Anyway, I did find some people that knew my mother. Uh, they were her cousins in Wales. That was that was the beginning, really, of, of joy, actually. The healing joy it was it was wonderful i had had my three sons beforehand and that was very joyful but this was a different kind of joy this was healing my core childhood pain mm -hmm. and these cousins well they were getting elderly so i'm pleased that i found them when i did and they told me about my mother's parents so it was just anecdotal it was just stories about them uh, and I learned a lot, and it was great. I learned that she was a very accomplished musician, um, and she loved opera. She played the piano. Uh, so th that was lovely for me to hear, because I had imagined her as a very depressed woman, um, you know, <laughs> with nothing going for her at all. And it was fabulous learning that she had such vibrant life skills. That, that was really wonderful. Um, I don't think I inherited any of those. <laughs> I don't play any instruments or anything. And then you I never know. You never know. You never the way, know. The way you pick up stuff, you may surprise yourself. <laughs> and later on, Julie, I discovered that uh, she had worked for the secret services in the war um, and it was all top secret. Uh, and she was a Morse code interceptor. Um, and there's a place in the UK uh, called, um, oh, the name escapes me. It'll come back to me in a moment. Um, and she worked there intercepting Morse code messages that were hidden. Um, uh, and she was somebody that was taught to intercept those messages and so it was, um, you know, it was espionage, I, I suppose, is what it comes under. Uh, and it was a very dangerous job. And uh, uh, and uh, she got decorated for that. So she's in a role of honour. Uh, Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park is, is the name of the place in the UK. And her name is written in, in gold leaf in the Book of Honour. Yeah. Yeah. That is 
Fantastic. What a wonderful story. Yes. And now I can understand why you say it's believed at some postpartum stress. However, she had another life. She was, her dynamics are not stay at home mom. Yeah. She's a creator and she might have had secrets and knowledge. So I know that some things are presented in one way and, and someone will come in and say, well, this is what it is. But unless someone questions the narrative, there might be a, a whole, like you said, a whole nother story. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, opening the oven door and gassing, that could be voluntary or involuntary. Yeah. Yeah. And hers, then, was, hers was voluntary. Well, how do you know? Nobody oh, was home. Oh, well, I mean, I'm just no. saying, like, if somebody were was threatened by her having this knowledge, they could set up the situation to make it look like it was her choice. Mm, well, that's interesting. I've never thought of that one, Julie. <laughs> well, that just came to me as you're talking. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. And there's just, it's just a whole thing and the whole idea that your sister went one place and you went another. And to me, that's just like, you know, like your dad had trouble with you because you represented her when, when she, when this happened, right? Yeah. Like, yes. and, and the story that's put place in place is that she was a depressed mom or she was overwhelmed or whatever, whatever it was, but you didn't get that story from her family and her cousins and you know things things don't and you'll find out one day you'll find out the truth whether it's on this side of the veil or the other side yeah. <laughs> yes indeed <laughs> but i would like to offer that there's been suicides that have been claimed as suicides that weren't and mm -hmm. i'm just saying unless you're yeah. there how do you know and that that seems like a very um i don't know it just came to me <laughs> Uh, it's really fascinating. Yeah. I mean, my, my tendency is to think that it, it was suicide. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. But that's a lot for you to carry around. It is. It has been. Mm -hmm. It has been. And your dad, when, and I'm going to skip forward to he got remarried. And he so did. with this orphanage, the law was when you're, when you have a spouse, when you're a widower and you take a bride, then you need to reclaim your child in this orphanage. Right. That was the parameters, right? Yes. So here, here you are, you were six. How old were you? Well, or, or there teenager, was a, I can't remember. Uh, I, I was very young when he got married for the second time. And I was taken out of the orphanage to be a bridesmaid. And then I was taken back again. And I never understood that. It was just bewildering to me. So clearly he was breaking the rules because he was supposed to reclaim me when he got married. So that's a mystery to me. I'll never understand that one. But I remember the pain of that, uh, being taken back to the orphanage because I thought that I was going home. And that was a terrible, terrible experience. The pain of that, yeah, is really, really huge. They treated you as an accessory, like... Oh, you know, yeah. we're getting flowers. We'll get Moria. She can be the flower girl. Oh. Exactly. Exactly that. Very, very Top mindless. Time, really. It was mm. so cruel. Yeah, it was so cruel. And then, um, so two or three years later, then I was uh, seven or nearly seven, just about seven. Um, then he got married for the third time. And I was then removed from the orphanage. And my sister was brought from grandparents. And there we all were, four of us, supposed to make this happy household. Well, <laughs> that did not work. <laughs> it's, it's a bit crazy to think you can bring a child out of um, seven years of institutional care and expect them to know how to live in a family. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. So right. I was very disruptive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which you have every right to be. Yes. And they didn't know how to handle me. Um, and unfortunately, my stepmother was a narcissist. She was very violent. Mm -hmm. So 
It was not not a good time. So there was still no joy. Right. So I just I honor I honor that painful story because it's it's vulnerability, it's hard and it's, you know, thank you for sharing it, but it also helps give you validation for your work and where you are mm-hmm. sitting today able to find joy to have grandchildren you're loving on. You have three happily married sons, um, just in a thriving practice. So it's just a testimony to the human spirit. And Isn't it, it just, yes, yes. Nature and nurture. And and you decided to take nurture and say, it didn't happen, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it. I'm going to make this life. So do you ever feel yeah. like you have angels around you guiding you or that, oh, that definitely. you're- Oh, yeah. gosh, yes, <laughs> absolutely, I do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I know that they, they have guided you. I can feel oh, that. Without a doubt, Julie, yes, yes. And I'd love, with your permission, to read a little quote from your book and then have you expand on what you meant. Okay. <laughs> a little exercise. <laughs> it's like a tea time with Moira. <laughs> Luckily, I I left my tea upstairs. You're you're at nighttime. I'm I'm in the early or late morning, and you're getting ready for dinner. So, (laughs) all right, here it goes. It always it had always been there within me, but I simply hadn't noticed it because I had boxed it in and put it away. And I believe that was your your light. Yes, that's making me emotional. Hearing my words read back to me by you. That's beautiful. Mm, yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. So how how did you discover the box that you needed to open? Like give us a little insight. Tell us about isn't that. Isn't it isn't it amazing? Yeah, it's such a good question that. I could have been so bitter and angry, and I was at times. Um I think the first moment, really, Julie, when I noticed something shifting in me was after I gave birth to my first son, who's in his mid-40s now. Um, It was a long time ago. And um, I was very depressed. And I can remember one day standing in the kitchen of my home, and I was scared. I was thinking, oh, my goodness, I feel so depressed and so anxious I I, I think I might kill myself like my mother did and it frightened me so much I decided to go to therapy I decided standing there in my kitchen right I have to do something I have to stop feeling like this I don't want to feel like this anymore it was so powerful I remember it so clearly so I I started therapy and that was the beginning of a a long, long therapeutic journey full of ups and downs, but it's led me to where I am now. Mm. So that was the beginning of opening the box. It was a tiny little lift the lid, put it down. (laughs) Yeah, the love for your son was was a perspective you needed to realize there was even a box sitting there, right? Like, I don't want to be here. And the you know, thought. post. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, so, Julie. Oh no, the, no. The thought. The the thought of leaving my son because I only had the one then, um, feeling the same as I had as a child. I couldn't possibly have done that. I couldn't have put him through that. Yeah. You took a cycle of. Obviously, your father didn't have. He didn't have the kind of loving parenting to model to even like you know like I remember listening in your book and you know the one time he brought up a picture of your mom and you asked him about it and he was able to share some and you know that third stepmother wasn't going to have it and and he wasn't going to stand up for whatever reason he didn't think he could do it alone yeah And your forgiveness of him and writing the letters to him, releasing him. You didn't condone his behavior. You didn't say it was okay, but you said, I'm not going to hold on to this. And and 
he had yeah. his reasons, he had his weaknesses. Obviously, it was very deep set because what he did is un is un um, comprehensible. <laughs> it's just, but um, yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's neglect and abuse, and you know, it was that's it's rough. But you know, through yeah. the lens of our you know 2023, these things you know we this doesn't happen. Hopefully I haven't heard of this happening to anyone else. So, you know, I feel like humanity's evolved and, you know, there's many, oh, I know my yeah. great grand, my great, great grandfather on my mother's side was raised in an orphanage in the United States um, because his dad was killed in a, a tractor um, accident and he was raised by nuns. But um, there's definitely some darkness on that side yeah. of my mom's family. Like my, my mom's dad was very harsh. His famous yeah. quote was the moment you lit, well, the moment you're born, you start to die. That was his yeah. famous quote. That was his lens on life. How sad. Yeah. And yeah. And it's, the, mm. the, you know, for some reason the institution is supposed to be Christianity and, and religious, but for some reason it had this layer of darkness just placed over it. And, um, and the souls that have suffered, you know, it's, you're not the only one, but it's, you know, it's so, I'm so happy that we seem to have moved on oh, from that kind you. of institutional, like, trauma. Gosh. It, and that... it, is, it is traumatic. Yeah, it, it mm -hmm. is really traumatic. I, I hope that I now look through the lens of my heart. Mm hmm. Yes, I think you've accomplished that so much. And that, that's what I'd love for you to tell me about the self love project. Um, you mentioned that in your audiobook. It's in my notes. <laughs> so when you say project, I'm just wondering what you're referring to. It might have been a chapter title. And I'll take this, this small talk out, you know. Okay. Like, okay. Oh, um, okay. If you can um, think about. Well, I, I mean, it's it's something I believe passionately in, Julie, that our relationship with ourself um, really dictates our relationship with everyone else. So, you know, if I'm hating myself and hating my inner child, which I used to, then it's going to be very difficult for me to love someone else really deeply and unconditionally. So I discovered that little by little, I could start to love the innocence in her. She didn't do anything wrong. It wasn't her fault. The things that happened to her were not her fault. So I was able to forgive her and love her unconditionally. doesn't mean I have to love all the behaviors I've done. I've done some pretty awful behaviors in my life, and other people have done some pretty awful behaviors to me. So. Self-love and forgiveness, to me, is not about accepting all the behaviours I've done. Um, that, that's, a, that's a different journey, really, to reconcile myself to those. It's about forgiving and loving the innocent part of myself, my inner child, and the innocent inner child within everyone else, within all of us. Right, to so, see that, see that everybody has an innocent inner child yes mm -hmm. yes so I, I i teach that now i i i'm really passionate about that in my work yeah yeah that's awesome thank you and the, the inner child i know that i've done a couple episodes on the inner child but it's just fascinating to me um how when you connect and you say okay inner child you know this is something we went through. I see you and you're in this scared place. I see you and you feel neglected or you feel, you know, ignored. But I'm holding you and I have you. And yeah. I think that's a magical part of your memoir is that you've written the, these letters and people can read these letters and put in their own inner child conflicts or, you know, like even even the point of like, evaluating your belief system yes you know because oh, very much so yes that's a just, big part of it yeah 
because when when we're traumatized as a child, um, I'll come back to the word trauma. But when we're traumatized as a child and we're experiencing such fear and sadness and pain, um, we start to tell ourselves a story. We 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 don't know we're doing it because our brain is just little and new. But we're laying down the foundations of a story about how bad we are. Well, it must be my fault that daddy doesn't love me. Uh, I must have done something terribly bad for mummy to leave me, and so on and so forth. It's got to be my fault. I can't blame mummy and daddy because I need them and they need to look after me. Um, so it's got to be me. And this is the child's way of trying to stay safe, trying to make some sense and meaning out of what's happening. Uh, to her or him yeah the word trauma in, in in the olden days long long time ago um experts used to tell us that trauma was about having some terrible accident a car crash a train crash something awful awful had happened nowadays experts know that anything that disrupts the the the, the equilibrium of the baby and the child is, is traumatic to that child, where the child feels scared, abandoned, rejected, anything at all that really upsets the child's um, nervous system. That is trauma. Mm. So we apply that word much more universally now. Yeah, it's a perceived mm. threat. It's, a, it's an idea that you're, you're vulnerable, that you're feeling unsafe, unseen. Yes. yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah. And to a child, that perceived threat is very, very real. Like, I'm going to die if I don't feel safe, if I'm not looked after, no one's here for me, I I'll die. And that's mm -hmm. not true, but it feels true. Right. And then, you know, it's crazy how kids believe everything that you say to them. Yes. And so, you know, parents don't realize, you know, these, these idle threats to control a child's behavior. Yes. You know, these blanket statements, they're taken as gospel truth. I mean, yes. and it's something you have to unlearn. You have to really look. Is that, does that make sense to me as an mm. adult? You know, like there's so many, there's so many things to uncover and to question. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's good that it's good that these things are coming to surface and, you know, these paradigms. I, it um, is. I used to just listen to the news and think it was all truth. And yeah. then, you know, and now, like, I don't even believe the death report of your mom. I'm like, well, who says? <laughs> yes. You know, like, yeah. I, I'm getting to the point where I'm like, you know, I'm going to create my own reality because who's to say I'm wrong? Yeah. <laughs> I believe we can change timelines. Like, just, you don't like where you are. You you jump on another timeline. You you figure, I was listening to... um. Joe Dispenza this morning, and he was talking oh, about, wonderful. oh, yeah, the how, you know, and he was talking about beliefs, too. That might be why it's on the tip of my tongue. But, you know, when you envision how you want something to happen. So, like, if you envisioned your dad keeping you after that second wedding, the flower girl scenario, you, envision, you envision him wrapping his arms around in you and saying, hey, you know, we're a family. And you were, you were younger then, so you you might have been able to work through more of the trauma or adjust to the family situation more than, than That's right. you know, because I imagine when you went back, when you got introduced in the family again with this other narcissistic stepmom, yeah, you were probably unsure if you're even going to stay. So you didn't want to bond because yeah. you might be pushed back again anyway. So what's the point of opening your heart and, and feeling Absolutely. love in their family? Absolutely spot on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was so, very closed. I was very closed by then. Yeah. Yeah. Listening to your book, I felt like you were, um, you know, I envisioned this, this wild creature. <laughs> and you were just looking for someone to wrap you, hug you and tame yeah. you. Yes. But you were like this, you know, even like a different language, like you didn't understand love and, and you didn't understand the family dynamics and you just needed someone to tame you. Yes, yes, that, that, that's, 
That's a really clever language. That's so true. Yes, it is. Thank you for that. I love that. Yes. Mm. What I did learn later on is that, of course, love was already in me. And that's where I found my joy when I realized that my my soul uh, in that innocent child part of me was just pure love. Mm -hmm. I was already inside me. Uh, yeah. It's a pity I didn't know that earlier in life, but hey ho, I know it now. Mm -hmm. And I'll try and spread it and share it as much as I can. <laughs> yes, yes. And know that there's layers, but you can unpeel those layers and you can get to yeah. it. Everyone deserves it's a birthright to be loved. And we're only here because God loved us. Yes. And he put us here to love. Yes. And we're turning we're turning the paradigms around. There are things that have been placed on us by institutions, by by people who didn't respect love. And these things are being turned around with our you know, they Venus are. is strong and, and we're entering, you know, this age of Aquarius where energies are shifting and, and we're we're turning it upside down. We're shaking we it up. Are. Yes. Yeah. Well, you are my warrior sister, and I oh, honor no. you're Thank like you so much. You know the Shira, Shira, Princess of Power. Have you do you remember? <laughs> Yay. That is that is how I picture you. <laughs> wonderful. Oh, it's just oh. been a divine conversation, and I thank you, and I thank God for bringing us together in this yes, wonderful indeed. time. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so, so much. 